It has been two years since our last video on ivermectin and cancer. It is time for an update. Things have been happening in the science world with studies and updates there. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions about what Rachel has been doing specifically with ivermectin. Uh, and so we wanna tackle those things today in this 2023 ivermectin update. Let's get into it. All right, we're talking 2023 ivermectin update. First off, as always, I am not a doctor. Please don't take anything I say to be medical advice for your specific situation. We're talking from our experience, what we've found in our own research in Rachel's cancer journey as we've been working with her doctors. And so we will always recommend that you work with a team of doctors that you surround yourself with that are open to a new and emerging science concepts in cancer treatment, uh, but that always we, we look to the science, the research, the, the evidence of, of really beneficial outcomes. And so that's what we're talking about today. All right, we're specifically going to tackle three main areas. We're going to talk uh, study updates since 2021. So what's happening in the, the, the clinical study realm around ivermectin and cancer. We're gonna talk the specific dosage and methods and plan for Rachel, because that's where we've gotten most of our questions over the last two years. And then finally, we're gonna talk just a little bit about how to get ivermectin for cancer. Again, ivermectin is, is this kind of trigger word in the world right now. And so it can get uh, lost if you go to your doctor and say, hey, can I have ivermectin? That doctor may have a response based on things completely unrelated to the cancer research happening. And so uh, having the right tools in your toolbox to handle that is important. So that'll be the third thing we tackle today. All right, but first let's get into the study updates since 2021, so since two years ago. All right, so from the studies that we looked at back in 2021, there are no new results coming out of those studies yet. And so uh, it really takes a long time. Many of the studies we looked at are on a five year or even 10 year time frame. And so uh, we haven't seen those, those documented results coming out of those yet, but there are two new studies that have kicked off that I think are worth talking about. Both of them were last year, and one is looking to validate whether ivermectin suppresses pancreatic cancer, uh, utilizing the mitochondria dysfunction pathway. And the second one is looking at ivermectin as an inhibitor for tumor metastases. And so uh, what this demonstrates for me is that the, the research is continuing. There continues to be a backing, seeing that ivermectin can be valuable in specific cancer situations. And so that's what we're keeping an eye on. Now, even though there's not specifically new study results documented and published, uh, there, there are a series of studies happening at City of Hope by a doctor named Peter Lee. And uh, he's been running these studies for a few years already. And uh, there was an interview with, with Dr. Lee that I thought was really worth highlighting because he talks about some of what they're starting to see demonstrated. So again, not the documented um, record of the study yet or, or the, the finalized peer reviewed results of the study, but some really promising things that he mentions. And so uh, the first thing they were trying to validate is if ivermectin induces immunogenic cell death. And what they found so far, this is his own words, is that cancer cells do not form tumors in animals that have already been exposed to ivermectin treated cancer cells. And so what's interesting is they, they were seeing that um, if they can take cancer cells, treat it with ivermectin, reintroduce it to the environment, almost like a lot of vaccines work, that that can um, almost seemingly vaccinate, uh, and these were animal studies, vaccinate an animal against the further formation of those tumors. It seems to induce some form of, of immune system's ability to recognize those cells. The second thing they were looking at is if ivermectin synergized with an immune-based treatment, such as uh, anti-PD-1, which is just a specific immune-based treatment. What they found is that ivermectin was actually triggering an immune response as shown by the presence of immune cells within the tumor. And so ivermectin was, was inducing 
the immune system to recognize and penetrate the tumor, which is huge. They also found that ivermectin by itself was insufficient to stop the growth of existing tumors. And so this isn't a, a big surprise. Often when we look at alternative treatment options, they can be kind of like a slow moving ship. They can take time to, uh, to change our body's structure and the trends that our immune system have been on. And so um, that was maybe a word of caution that he was giving was that they weren't seeing that ivermectin by itself was sufficient to stop the growth of existing tumors. And then uh, they are moving forward and currently running studies to determine if ivermectin can induce enough immunogenic death of growing cancer cells to auto vaccinate people against that cancer. Okay, so that's what we were talking about in that in that first point up there. They are looking to see if they can essentially use ivermectin in a way that creates a vaccine response in someone, uh, essentially ramping up their immune system, specifically targeting that type of cancer cell. So that's super, super exciting on the front of, of ivermectin research. And um, we are keeping a really close eye on this for Rachel, uh, but also for the Cancer Box and the audience here. Uh, and we will update you as we find out more. All right, let's talk about Rachel's plan. Some of you may be just waiting for this section because these are the questions you've been asking because we didn't get super specific in our last video. So let's talk specific dosage uh, and methods for Rachel specifically. So here's Rachel's plan. She ranges from 12 to 36 milligrams of ivermectin daily, depending on her tolerance. I say 12 to 36 because what will often happen is, um, let's say that she's at the 36 mark, that might upset her stomach a little bit. And uh, if that happens, we're gonna ramp back and then ease back into it. We're not gonna, we're not gonna put her in a state of discomfort. Um, and so when we see that response, we just go, okay, let's, let's tone that back a little bit tomorrow. Uh, and, and so that's why it can range anywhere from 12 to 36. Really the target is 36, but sometimes that doesn't seem to, to be quite tolerable for, for Rachel's stomach. She's doing this four times per week. Um, and the reason for that is to modulate the impact and to reduce the opportunity for resistance. So really the idea is essentially we're keeping the cancer on its toes. It doesn't know when there's gonna be ivermectin in the system or not. It can't really build a tolerance in the same way that it would if you were just constantly dosing the same amount every day to, to, your, to your system. And so um, I will be honest, there's not the research for ivermectin that shows that that's an effective approach. It was something in talking with, with uh, some of Rachel's doctors that we said, okay, let's give this a try. It, it works with other things like uh, vitamin C or, or uh, turkey tail mushrooms. And so maybe let's see if that seems to be effective with ivermectin as well. She takes it in the mornings just before a meal. Um, and we just had to figure out that that's what made sense. If she ate and then took ivermectin, it would upset her stomach. If she took ivermectin and didn't eat soon enough after that, it would upset her stomach. And so we really just found, okay, yep, right before you eat, pop the pills, uh, have your breakfast, have your cup of coffee and move forward with the day. And she really on a normal day doesn't have any adverse side effects or, or side effects that she notices at all, as, as long as we're following the plan. So that is what Rachel's doing. Again, that is not um, something that should, is intended to be a cookie cutter for anybody else. Um, we're really just trying this. Rachel is stage four colon cancer. Um, now she's she's in remission right now, which is wonderful. Um, uh, we actually just celebrated the five year mark since her uh, since her original diagnosis, and so um, we we're on this journey of some things have popped up, and we've been able to treat them. Uh, but we are continuing with ivermectin because we believe in its efficacy in a cancer environment. Okay, uh, I want to finish by talking a little bit about how to get ivermectin for your cancer situation, because it can get a little bit complicated. So um, at a really basic level, uh, the first thing you can do is you can find a doctor that is willing to prescribe it for cancer support. 
uh, that's we haven't found that to be incredibly difficult to find a doctor that when when you bring some of the research that's been done to say hey this seems to to have very little side effects um, or adverse effects and it may help in my situation i'd like to try it are you willing to write me a prescription and at least in a lot of cases uh, they will be willing to do so uh, when you have that prescription, then you should be able to get it at most major pharmacies. Um, a couple caveats there, and, and the reason I call it not ideal here, is that um, it, first off, is is often going to be really expensive from uh, from a normal pharmacy. Um, we were seeing prices of like nine to ten dollars per uh, three to six milligrams at times. Um, so that gets really pricey really fast. And because it's off-label usage for what ivermectin was designed for, most insurance companies aren't going to cover it uh, for your, your treatment option. Um, there was also a period of time where pharmacies uh, were denying prescriptions, even though it was marked for cancer treatment because of the COVID complications happening at the time. I haven't heard of that happening uh, more recently, but maybe keep that in mind if you're just going to go to a normal pharmacy and try to fill an ivermectin uh, prescription. The second thing you can do is you can find a compounding pharmacy. Um, this is a pharmacy that can essentially make the pills for you that you need. Um, we have one here locally uh, in, in Vancouver, Washington, that uh, has the ability to produce ivermectin. And it's at a much lower rate than in normal pharmacies. And we're able to use that same prescription that we have and have them fill that. Uh, and that's been a really great option. We know a number of people who have, who have gone that route. And so you can, you can just search uh, compounding pharmacy in your area and start there. Some of them may have ivermectin as an option, some of them may not. So it may take some phone calls to get through to somebody. They're usually pretty helpful uh, and, and uh, reasonable people to, to talk to. Uh, the final option, and this is where it gets a, a little bit tricky, is some people do source ivermectin from outside of the U.S. They do this through a few different means. Um, sometimes if they're close to a border town, they may travel into either Canada or Mexico. This is, assumes that you're already based in the U.S. And, um, and so they go to a pharmacy where they can just purchase it over the counter in in. Uh, another country other than the US and travel back with it. Um, that, that's one method. Uh, another method is there are pharmacies in uh, India and, and uh, other places where you can just bulk order pills. Again, that's um, pretty complicated because you have nothing uh, certifying what that is or that they did it well or that it's actually what you expected it to be. And so uh, that can be um, a, a truly, genuinely dangerous option. Um, but some people, some people have done it. And so, what I really want to talk about in these different options are, um, I, I think it's just important as you make your decisions to know the the weight of of the decisions you're making. And so, um, there are some legality concerns if you're going the route of sourcing ivermectin outside of the US, outside of the purview of the FDA, who kind of gives a stamp of approval on any pills you would get from a local pharmacy or even a compounding pharmacy. Um, in most cases, this is actually straight out of uh, the, the FDA's um, uh, website. In most circumstances, it is illegal for individuals to import drugs into the United States for personal use. I think that's something that People maybe don't think intuitively. They think, well, as long as I'm not selling it, and it's not, you know, it's not a narcotic medication, um, it's fine. Um, from a legal perspective, uh, there's not a real distinction between what the medication is used for. There are some exceptions, and this is where um, I would say, uh, if you're really considering going this route, maybe consult a, a lawyer because this gets a little bit gray. But essentially, if the drug is for use for a serious condition for which effective treatment is not available in the United States. Um, so again, we're getting into a gray area where um, I would imagine the legal system would say cancer has effective treatment options available in the US. Again, some of our listeners 
may disagree with that from a, a holistic healing perspective. Um, that that uh, we may believe that the U.S. in some ways is behind other countries in their integrative approach to cancer treatment. Um, number two is if there's no commercialization or promotion of the drug to the U.S. residents. Basically, if you can't get it here, uh, then then p perhaps you could source it somewhere else. Three would be the drug is considered not to represent an unreasonable risk. I think ivermectin would likely fall under that uh, category. Four is uh, the person importing the drug verifies in writing that it is for his or her own use. So that's like when you're going over the border and you would declare that you picked these the, this medication up. Uh, and then finally, uh, that you're generally not purchasing or, or importing more than a three month supply of the drug uh, in, in question. And so those are some of the criteria that you should consider before even thinking about sourcing ivermectin or any other medication from outside the US. Um, so I found that interesting. Again, as we were as we were looking at options for us and for Rachel uh, and uh, and thought that would be helpful to share with you as well. So that's what we have today on ivermectin in 2023. We are going to keep a close eye on the research as it moves forward. We will give you updates as we see new breakthroughs occurring. Uh, and if we change anything in Rachel's plan, we'll make sure to let you know as well. If you have any questions, you can comment them below uh, or you can always reach out to us on our website uh, with uh, with my email there. And um, we'd, we'd love to, to talk with you. And uh, even if you just need somebody to talk to, I'm always happy to uh, to converse with someone who's going through a cancer journey uh, because none of us are as strong or as smart as all of us.